Done. Thanks, Scott. You're welcome. I will uh, move you back to the audience ranks of attendees. <laughs> I'm honored. We have about two minutes left, so we'll wait for a couple more people to join. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to show you this inside look into our exhibits at the Constitution Center. Hi, Patty. The center is open. Yes, the National Constitution Center is open Wednesdays through Sundays now from 10 to 5. Um, and we um, will be offering free admission days coming up tomorrow, along with July 1st and July 4th. So if you want to visit us Wednesdays through Sundays, 10 to 5 with free admission for tomorrow, and then again on July 1st and July 4th. Thanks for asking. All right, so it's just about 1230. So I think we can uh, get started. I'm going to record this session. So Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual National Constitution Center. My name is Jenna. I am the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Center, and uh, I'm really excited to welcome you to today's special tour. Uh, this weekend, we are honoring Juneteenth, which for years has been the annual commemoration of the emancipation of slavery and just this week became a federal holiday. Uh, so tomorrow we are offering free admission at the Constitution Center and a lot of programs exploring this, uh, this holiday. Um, our neighbors, at the African American Museum are also free here in Philadelphia. So if you are able and in the area, come on down. But today we're bringing the museum to you by giving you a special tour of our exhibit, um, The Civil War and Reconstruction, The Battle for Freedom and Equality. And to guide us through the exhibit is my wonderful colleague, Kevin Lynch. So please welcome Kevin and enjoy the exhibit, The, uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction, The Battle for Freedom and Equality. Okay, thank you, Jenna, and good afternoon, everyone, uh, go, or good morning, depending on where you're visiting from. Uh, thank you all so very much for joining us today. The first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and spotlight my video, or if I could have Jenna spotlight me for me, um, that way everyone should be able, there we go, everyone should be able to have a bigger view of the exhibit spaces here. And as Jenna said, as we prepare to observe Juneteenth as a federal holiday this year, um, I'm happy to be your tour guide as we make our way through one of our most powerful and important exhibits here at the National Constitution Center, Civil War and Reconstruction, the Battle for Freedom and Equality. This exhibit is sort of divided into three sections. Uh, the first room that we're in here examines the story of slavery in America in the years leading up to the Civil War. We then examine the war itself. We have all sorts of artifacts from the war years, highlighted by a signed copy of the Emancipation Proclamation from President Lincoln. And then we focus on the period of Reconstruction as the nation struggled to rebuild itself, not only physically, but constitutionally as well. So we will examine the legacy of Reconstruction in general, and particularly the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But we begin here in this room, focusing on the story of slavery in America. Um, and though we think of the Civil War as the 19th century between North and South, um, our story really begins back with the signing of the Constitution in 1787. And for all the successes that the founding generation had during that summer, creating the different branches of government, creating the office of the presidency, resolving so many of the issues that existed under the previous government, the Articles of Confederation, there's one major issue that, of course, they cannot resolve, and that is the question of slavery. Some of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention wanted to do away with slavery at that moment, but there were over 20 delegates who were themselves slaveholders. And when it came to the great question of whether or not enslaved persons would actually count towards the population for the purposes of representation, they adopt the now infamous three-fifths compromise, agreeing to count enslaved persons as three-fifths of an individual. <laughs> 
So for all their successes, the question of slavery would be left to future generations of Americans to grapple with and ultimately to wage a civil war on. Now, as we move forward into the 1800s, there are two things that happen with the country. You know, we think of the Civil War between North and South, um, but during colonial America, all 13 of the original colonies had slavery in some form. Some of the Northern states, however, begin to do away with slavery on their own. Uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire do away with slavery in years prior to the Constitutional Convention. Other states like New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey pass acts of gradual emancipation. Slavery will gradually be ending in the early 1800s. The southern states, of course, will hold on to slavery. But at the same time, the country is expanding west and occupying vast territory from sea to shining sea. But every time we add in a new state, something that you think would be a cause for national celebration, it further inflames the question of slavery. Because with each new addition to the Union, new territory coming in, the question becomes, will slavery expand into that new territory? Will that new state be free territory or slave territory? So I want to sort of transition over here to our first display of artifacts. And if you take a look at this map up over here behind me, now it's a little difficult to see from our vantage point, um, but I can explain that it's a sort of county by county breakdown of all of the different states that would make up the slave states in 1860 that had slavery at that point, sort of darker shaded counties, a greater percentage of slavery. Uh, and there were three states at the time of the Civil War that had more enslaved persons living in than free. But for our purposes, I want to focus on this one section of the map right over here. And if you can see, this is the territory of Missouri. In 1820, Missouri is seeking admission to the Union. And like questions before, the question becomes, would it be a free or slave state? Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky proposes what becomes known as the Missouri Compromise. Missouri will be added as a slave state. But to keep the balance, in Congress and throughout the states, we're going to add Maine, which up till this point had been part of Massachusetts, as a free state. And further, we're going to draw a line across the southern border of, of Missouri here, this line here. That will extend across the country. And the notion was any territory added north of that line would be free. Any territory south of that line was open to slavery. So this is the so-called Missouri Compromise that is supposed to hold the nation together. Now, as we move forward into our first display of artifacts here, um, in this room, we very much want to tell the story of those enslaved persons living in America. And to the extent that they could, they are able to maintain culture. Uh, music was a very important part of that culture. So this mandolin that we see here from the early 1800s. Um, but we also have artifacts that detail the horrors of slavery. Of course, the shackles here need no further explanation. Um, we have a receipt down here for a woman named Jane, who was sold in 1851 for $525. So focusing on the stories of people and the ways that they were able to fight against slavery. One of the most famous ways that people did so was through that secret system known as the Underground Railroad. Now, we don't know for certain exactly how many people, how many freedom seekers used this system to escape slavery. There weren't a lot of records kept for obvious reasons. But there was a man living here in Philadelphia named William Still, the so-called father of the Underground Railroad. And he does keep accounts of the names of freedom seekers, where they had escaped from, where they're traveling next, and any new names if they're going to change their name. These records would have been catastrophic if they fell into the wrong hands. But he maintains these records to keep some hope of friends and family being able to reconnect with relatives who may have escaped slavery months or even years before they did. And after the war, still is able to publish these records. Uh, we have a first edition account here from 1872 of William Still's The Underground Railroad. We can still buy later editions of this book today, and it remains by far the best first person account of The Underground Railroad. Now, some of the stories, some of the more famous stories of people fighting against slavery are more well known to us. Um, so one of the most famous uh, of people operating on the Underground Railroad as a conductor um, would have been Harriet Tubman. Uh, likewise, Frederick Douglass becomes one of the most powerful orators in the fight against slavery. Um, so someone like a Harriet Tubman, and Frederick Douglass, of course, well known. Um, but we also chronicle the names of people who perhaps are not as famous. Uh, like over here, we have Henry Brown. 
who acquires the nickname Box after he confined himself in a small box for about 26 hours, pretending to be dried goods. And he literally shipped himself to freedom, arriving, in fact, at the home of William Still, uh, who you can see there second from the left. But during these years, one of the most important challenges against the institution of slavery uh, is actually a legal one. And it concerns the two people that we have over here behind me. And I am, of course, referring to the case of Dred and Harriet Scott. The Scots had been living for a number of years in free territory. So we go back to that Missouri Compromise. They were living as far north as Fort Snelling, Minnesota. So can't get much farther north than that. And in 1846, they petition the court for their freedom. And in fact, we are at various times able to display petitions from both Dred and Harriet Scott, which we're able to see here. I want to kind of zoom in and note, uh, because we get a lot of questions about whether or not the Scots would actually have penned this document themselves. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of enslaved persons were prohibited from learning how to read and write. Um, but down over here at the bottom where you can see Dred Scott, um, and right sort of in the center there, that sort of plus sign, that X there, where it says his mark, that would have been how Dred Scott would have authenticated this document. It takes 11 years for the Scots case to make its way up to the Supreme Court. And in the opinion of the Dred Scott case, Chief Justice Roger Taney argued that, well, he said that the founding fathers never intended for African Americans to be citizens and had no rights to avail themselves in a court of law. He goes even further to suggest that the Missouri Compromise itself was unconstitutional, that Congress had no authority to do away with slavery in any territories held by the United States. And furthermore, in the opinion of Chief Justice Taney, the Scots had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. For all the history of the Supreme Court, this is often cited as the worst decision in the court's history. Taney and other justices expected that it would settle the question of slavery once and for all. It has the exact opposite. It further propels the nation that much faster towards civil war. Now, before we head into the war years themselves, I have a number of artifacts on the opposing wall over here that I'd like to show that can contribute to this acceleration into war. Uh, and literature was such an important part of it. Um, so up over here in 1852, we have what would become the second best-selling book in America during the 19th century, uh, and that is Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, a vivid account of the brutalities of slavery. We don't know the exact nature of the exchange. We do know that Harriet Beecher Stowe met with President Lincoln during the Civil War. Uh, and supposedly, the exchange that followed uh, included President Lincoln referring to Harriet Beecher Stowe, saying, so you are the woman who wrote the book that made this great war. Likewise, during these early years, literature from abolitionists, people in the North who were in favor of doing away with slavery immediately, and even educating people from a young age. Uh, here we have the anti-slavery alphabet, a children's book, um, so the ABCs of abolition. T is the rank tobacco plant raised by slave labor too, a poisonous and nasty thing for gentlemen to chew. So all of these different ways that abolitionists in the North are advocating for the end of slavery. Others had still more violent tactics. Um, so in 1857, John Brown, um, in 1857 into 1858 and 59, uh, John Brown would lead a series of raids um, intending to violently overthrow the institution of slavery, um, notably culminating at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Um, Brown's raid, of course, was unsuccessful uh, and he would be tried and executed, becoming a martyr for those in the North. Um, and we do have over here a pipe that would have been used by John Brown um, during one of his raids. So all of these events sort of taking place in the 1850s, further accelerating the nation this much faster toward civil war. So we come now to the second portion of our exhibit, getting into the 1860s. Uh, and it's time now to meet President Lincoln, who up until this point had been a fairly ordinary member of a political party known as the Whigs. Uh, he had served one term in Congress with little distinction in the 1840s. And he had talked about the evils of slavery but Lincoln, like several other moderate Whigs, wasn't sure whether they or Congress or anybody had the authority to do away with slavery in territories where it had existed for several hundred years. But Lincoln always felt that the way to destroy slavery was to contain it and let it suffocate. So he was 
always ardently opposed to the expansion of slavery. Now, we had mentioned the Missouri Compromise from 1820. We fast forward now to 1854. A senator from Lincoln's home state of Illinois named Stephen Douglas, um, later the Douglas of the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, Douglas was proposing a theory known as popular sovereignty, this idea that we should overturn the Missouri Compromise and allow any new territory seeking admission to the Union to decide for themselves whether they wanted slavery or not. And this is aimed at the new territories of Kansas and Nebraska, which would have been both north of the Missouri Compromise and thus should have been free territory. Lincoln is so angered by this blatant expansionist Kansas-Nebraska Act that he helps to form a brand new political party dedicated to the expansion of slavery. And this is in fact the birth of the modern Republican Party. Abraham Lincoln would become the first Republican elected president in 1860. And on or in response to Lincoln's election, several states begin to secede from the Union, fearing that Lincoln's election would lead to immediate emancipation. Now, as Lincoln traveled from his home state of Illinois to Washington, D.C. to assume the powers of the presidency, he stops here in Philadelphia and he delivers a series of speeches, including one right across the street from where I am now on George Washington's birthday, February 22nd of 1861. Lincoln would raise a, an American flag that day, a portion of which can be seen on the wall behind me. Uh, and then there's a wood carving over here depicting Lincoln raising the flag that day. And during the speech, Lincoln gave his thoughts about the history of the revolution and the Declaration of Independence, which Lincoln had grown up revering. And Lincoln remarked at that moment that powerfully, Lincoln says, I would rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender the principles of freedom and equality expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Of course, we, that powerful sentiment um, becomes even more powerful as we know what happens. Before we move on, I will make a note, the sort of plaster cast here of Lincoln's hands. Uh, you might've noticed that one is sort of grasping a broom handle. Um, supposedly President Lincoln had greeted so many well-wishers before sitting for this plaster cast and had shook so many hands um, that his right hand shook so much that to be able to keep it firm, he had to grasp a broom handle. Um, so this is sort of an exact plaster cast model of the hands uh, of President Lincoln. Now, in the immediate wake of Lincoln's election, several states begin to secede. South Carolina is the first state to do so. So over here, we have an ordinance from South Carolina stating their intent to secede. Um, ultimately, within the next several months, seven, six more states would join her. Ultimately, 11 states total would form the new Confederate States of America. They elect their own president, Jefferson Davis, seen down there in the red, um, and they create their own constitution, um, which very similar to the United States Constitution, um, but it does do something that the actual US Constitution did not do, uh, mentioning slavery in name. Violence for the war erupts in April of 1861 outside of a fort in Charleston, South Carolina, Fort Sumter. The Confederate general in charge of the shelling Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard had previously studied at West Point uh, under the tutelage of a man named Robert Anderson. Robert Anderson now commanded the fort that Beauregard was shelling. So this is an illustration early on that this war is going to be very much friend against friend, brother against brother. Now, if we move up here into the war years, there is questions early on about why this war is being fought. And in the early years, for really the first half of the war, According to Lincoln, the North, the stated war aim of the North was preservation of the Union. Lincoln remarked at one point that if I could save the Union without freeing a single enslaved person, I would do that. If I could save the Union by freeing some and leaving others in bondage, I would do that too. And there's a game board here that sort of illustrates this thinking. So I want to sort of so you hear the 18th century or the 19th century version of Shoots and Ladders. This is the game of secession or the sketches of rebellion. And as we sort of glance over it here, we see all of these different figures from the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, Winfield Scott, Jefferson Davis. This board game was produced well into the second year of the war. And for all of the different themes and images that you see here on this board, there is nothing on this board referencing slavery. Nothing, not one. Sort of reflecting here this sort of stated aim of 
pres preservation of the Union. But as the casualties of the war mount up, and ultimately more Americans would be killed during the Civil War than all other wars combined, all of the American wars combined. Um, for years, the number had been set around 620,000. Now some historians estimate as much as 750,000 or higher. As these casualties mount up, Lincoln begins to change his views and becomes convinced that all of this carnage cannot be simply for preservation of the old union. There needs to be a higher cause. And sometime by 1862, Lincoln had come to the conclusion that this higher cause was the ending of slavery and emancipation, not only for millions then held in bondage, but of unborn millions to come. So sometime by the summer of 1862, Lincoln has prepared his Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he would announce it in the fall of 1862 in the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam to take effect on January 1st, 1863. So sort of at this turning point in the war. And I wanna highlight here our version of the Emancipation Proclamation. This is not the original, that Lincoln signed in 1863, but it is one of 47 copies that were auctioned off and signed the next year here in Philadelphia to raise money for the war effort. Signed by President Lincoln and his Secretary of State, William Seward. And these sold for $10 a piece in 1864, roughly a month's salary for a Civil War soldier. This document does not do away with slavery entirely. Several of the border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, states that had slavery but had not yet seceded from the Union, they were exempt from this proclamation. And likewise, several states in uh, areas of Tennessee, there were other areas that does not do away with slavery entirely. But nonetheless, it promises freedom to over 3 million enslaved persons in the United States. And it is the news of this proclamation gradually traveling throughout the Confederate states um, to become sort of this changing of the cause of the war, redefining it from preservation of the old union to a crusade against the institution of slavery. And it is news of this document on June 19th, 1865, brought by Union Major General Gordon Granger to citizens in Texas, a state that had over 250,000 enslaved persons, bringing the news that slavery was over in America. And it is for this reason, this anniversary that we mark Juneteenth as the ending of slavery. And now we observe it as a federal holiday. So the Emancipation Proclamation changes the scope of the war. Uh, it also changes some of the nature of union policy. So up until this point, Lincoln and the North had been fairly reluctant to employ the use of African-American soldiers to fight in the war. Um, but this begins to change in 1863. Um, so over here, we have a training manual uh, for African-American troops um, who would have fought in the war. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the 1989 movie Glory, um, depicting the heroism of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. Uh, we have enlistment papers over here as well. Um, and African-Americans do serve and fight in the war. Um, so this is a major change, major departure from previous Union policy. So as we sort of make our way up here through the war years, I do want to highlight a series of artifacts briefly. This is sort of our Civil War display case over here. Flags, banners, muskets, food, musical instruments, um, all sorts of material sort of from the Civil War, um, sort of depicting what soldiers would have used, what soldiers would have been familiar with. Um, and, and interestingly, sort of right in the center here, we have a piece of Civil War era food. This is genuine hardtack, which would have been a staple for Union and Confederate diets. Uh, it would have been stale in 1862, and I would imagine quite still stale today. Um, there's all sorts of artifacts in this display case, but there's one interesting note that I want to make um, regarding the American flag that we see over here. Uh, and of course, we're familiar with the each state is represented on the American flag by a star. But even with the coming of the Civil War, flags bearing the stars and stripes, including the one that Abraham Lincoln flo flew in front of Independence Hall, they never subtract stars from the flag. Um, so sort of this testament that it remains sort of one union, one nation uh, engaged in a civil war. Now, as we sort of come around here and sort of begin to conclude with the war years and making our way into the period of reconstruction, uh, I do want to pause and introduce a number of the key players in Congress um, that would have a major effect on the policies of Reconstruction. Um, so up over here, we have Thaddeus Stevens, 
a member of the House of Representatives. He's in the, the darker clothes there. Uh, and then his colleague in the Senate, Charles Sumner. Uh, and they had a vision for Reconstruction, sort of how this policy would change the nature of American history. Um, and their vision went far beyond simply ending slavery, ending the cause of slavery in America. Their vision in cases wanted to punish the Southern states for the cause of the war, perhaps confiscate Southern lands, but most significantly, they wanted to extend rights to African-Americans, extend rights to formerly enslaved persons under the constitution. Uh, notably, we have up over here, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts. Yes, the same Charles Sumner who was involved in and nearly caned to death on the floor of the Senate for speaking out against the institution of slavery. We have a note here, equality of rights is the first of rights. So their vision of reconstruction was far reaching, but it would come with opposition, notably from the man in the White House. So we sort of make our way around the corner here. April 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee finally surrenders his army of Northern Virginia to General Ulysses S. Grant. So the war is very nearly over. But the Union has less than one week to celebrate the surrender. On April 14th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated at Ford's Theater by the actor and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth. What is less known is that Lincoln was not the only target that evening. Booth had co-conspirators who were supposed to assassinate the vice president, Andrew Johnson, William Seward, the secretary of state, and General Ulysses S. Grant. In fact, Grant and his wife, Julia, had tickets to attend the play at Ford's Theater that evening, our American cousin, um, but they bow out at the last minute. Supposedly, Mrs. Grant and Mrs. Lincoln did not get along. William Seward was wounded that evening, uh, but he does survive. And the man assigned by Booth to assassinate Vice President Johnson decided not to do so. He lost his nerve. So Andrew Johnson, who was not Lincoln's first vice president, and he was picked in 1864 to broaden the ticket's appeal, would become the first man to assume the powers of the presidency by virtue of assassination. Johnson was markedly different from Lincoln for a number of reasons. He was a Democrat. He was a Southerner at heart and by birth. Uh, but during the war, he was the only senator from a seceding state, Tennessee, that did not leave the Union. So he's picked as Lincoln's vice president to help broaden the ticket's appeal. In the aftermath of Lincoln's assassination, Johnson reveals a markedly different plan for Reconstruction. His vision involves having the Southern states come back into the Union fairly easily. In many cases, he is okay with former Confederates resuming leadership roles, perhaps even in Congress. But above all, he really doesn't see a need to change the nature of the relationship between whites and blacks in this country. One of the measures that Abraham Lincoln had before he passed away, we never know exactly what Lincoln's plan would truly have been, but one institution that he did set up was a measure known as the Freedmen's Bureau an instrument designed to aid the transition of African-Americans from slavery into freedom. Andrew Johnson vetoed it. And this begins a series of battles between Johnson and the Republicans in Congress. And these battles over reconstruction policy would lead to the largest number of presidential vetoes, which was a record at the time, the largest number of congressional overturns of presidential vetoes. And that's a record that still stands and the first ever presidential impeachment. Andrew Johnson would be impeached by the United States Congress in 1868 and would in fact survive his Senate trial and removal from office by one vote. So as we sort of make our way through into the period of reconstruction, of course we focus on the constitutional legacy, the changes that occurred during these years. And there are three amendments during these years uh, that sort of in this change constitutionally. And these, of course, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So we have the 13th Amendment here, of course, and this is the one that ends slavery, granting constitutional backing to the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Um, so our vision here, or our version here of the 13th Amendment, uh, and of course, this is the one abolishing slavery. Uh, Lincoln would, of course, live to see the 13th Amendment passed by Congress in January of 1865, for those of you who saw the movie with Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, it would be ratified by the required three quarters of the states in December of 1865. But the question now becomes, for these nearly 4 million persons recently freed by the 13th Amendment, what exactly is their status? Are they citizens? Do they have the rights to protection under the law? Do they have the right to vote? And if we recall the decision that was still on the books, the Dred Scott case from 1858, they in fact were not considered citizens. So how does Congress then move forward to make sure that these formerly enslaved persons did have rights under the law? And there was debate even amongst the Republicans in Congress as to how best to do that. Some of them argued simply for congressional legislation. And in 1866, there is a Civil Rights Act uh, that is designed to extend rights, extend equality under the law. Uh, and we have a version of the Civil Rights Act up here in 1866. But sort of similar to the Emancipation Proclamation, there's question as to how far this document can go, how much legal authority this document has. Um, so Congress begins to talk about another constitutional amendment. Uh, and this one would be to enforce rights of citizenship for all citizens. Uh, and we have throughout this exhibit, a series of interactives. Uh, if you're familiar with our interactive constitution, um, these different interactives where you can learn in depth sort of about the debates, the proposed text, text that was added in, text that was kept off of each of these reconstruction amendments. Um, so I encourage you to go on our website and take a look at these different features in our interactive constitution. The 14th amendment is one of the longest ever added to the constitution. Uh, and a series of clauses from the sec section one of the 14th amendment do establish rights of citizenship. Um, trying exactly who is a citizen, who has the rights, the privileges and immunities, immunities of citizenship, who has the right to due process under law. So it goes towards establishing who exactly is a citizen under the United States. Um, but now people begin to question sort of in looking at the rights and responsibilities of citizens, one of those most important of all rights of citizens. And that of course is the right to vote. And there's a great question after the 14th amendment of who exactly does have the right to vote. Now, as we sort of move here into the years of reconstruction, um, I do want to highlight sort of some of the African-Americans who for the first time in the Southern states are able to in fact exercise some political voice. One of the most significant artifacts that we have in this exhibit, I think, is also one of the most assuming. This green box right here, uh, there's still a label on the back of it for concentrated Jamaica ginger. But by 1868, this had been repurposed as a ballot box and would have caught some of the first legal votes of African Americans in the southern states. During the presidential election of 1868, some 500,000 African Americans are able to vote in that election. But more so than simply just voting, African Americans are able to hold elected office. They're elected to local office. So here we have some of the first African Americans to serve in the United States Senate. Hiram Rhodes Revels and Blanche Bruce over here are the first to serve in the United States Senate in 1870. At the same time, uh, Thomas Ramey becomes the first to serve in the House of Representatives. Um, but all, all through down, from Washington on down to local officials, there are thousands uh, of formerly enslaved persons, African Americans, who are now able to exercise political power or to hold political office. Uh, and we have a wonderful interactive that you can also see on our website um, that sort of chronicles the different or the numbers by state by state um, of the states in the former Confederacy. Um, and those that are able to actually hold elected office during these years. But we return to sort of that question of voting because political participation from formerly enslaved persons um, is not without opposition. Uh, and there are challenges to this new political power, whether it be through poll taxes, literacy tests, which we have over here behind me, um, or outright terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Um, there is resistance to this new political power and particularly with the right to vote. So by 1870, we now have our third of these three reconstruction amendments, uh, and that would be the 15th. 
Now, the text of the 15th Amendment states that the right to vote cannot be denied on the base of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So it's not immediately clear exactly who that applies to, um, but the court would ultimately determine that this would apply to African-American men, but not yet women. Uh, and this would, in fact, fracture the leadership of the Women's Suffrage Party. Um, so over here, we have people like Lucy Stone, um, who argued and debated with Frederick Douglass, who had been one of the longest supporters of women's suffrage. Go all the way back to 1848 with the Declaration of Sentiments. One of the 32 men to sign that document was Frederick Douglass. Fast forward to 1868, Lucy Stone and Frederick Douglass are engaged in debates about who needs the vote more white women or black men. Ultimately, though, Lucy Stone would support the passage of the 15th Amendment. Others, notably Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, did not support the 15th Amendment uh, and moved immediately to have another amendment that would extend the right to vote to women as well. Uh, and of course, it would be another 50 years until 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Meanwhile, during the 1870s, we begin to see sort of rollbacks to the effect, people are wondering, you know, how much or how far do these amendments actually go? Reconstruction is often cited as the period chronologically from 1865 up until 1877. The year 1876 was one of the most controversial presidential elections in history. Uh, that year, Rutherford Hayes, governor of Ohio, runs against Democrat Samuel Tilden of New York. It is a very close disputed election. Several states' ballots are questioned um, and Tilted ultimately wins the popular vote. But after recounts and a special electoral committee, um, ultimately Hayes would be declared the winner. But there was still opposition. And up until the days before Hayes' inauguration, it looked like there would be continued opposition. But that opposition evaporates. Hayes becomes the president and then ultimately moves to end or pull the last remaining troops in the Southern states enforcing the policies of reconstruction. So it's seen as some sort of great compromise that Hayes made concessions in exchange for the presidency. But nonetheless, 1877 is often considered to be sort of near the end of policies of reconstruction. And at the same time, there are a series of court cases during these years. Um, the Slaughterhouse cases in 1873, the Cruikshank case of, the, uh, I think also 1873 or 76, um, and then perhaps most infamously, the 1896 decision of Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, very similar to the story of Rosa Parks. Uh, Homer Plessy has a ticket aboard a, a uh, railroad in Louisiana um, and is arrested for not uh, refusing to give up his seat um, on the railroad. Um, and this is the case where the Supreme Court, over the objection of John Marshall Harland, who argued emphatically that our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. He was outvoted seven to one on the court, arguing at this case that separate but equal is allowed under the Constitution. So these cases, these rollbacks here in the late 1800s, as the nation goes from reconstruction into the subsequent period of Jim Crow laws, institutionalized segregation, um, and tolerated racism. Um, so all of this contributes to our sort of trying to wrestle with the legacy of reconstruction um, and sort of translates nicely into this sort of video that we have here, sort of bridging the gap between the end of reconstruction and the civil rights movement that would come nearly a century later. And in sort of assessing the legacy of Reconstruction and sort of looking at the civil rights movement, you know, we wonder, you know, could these changes have happened a century earlier? You know, what if Lincoln had survived? What if more had been done? And historians have grappled with the history of Reconstruction. Uh, and many institutions argued, looking at it, that it was a failure, that it did not work. And looking at it, though, we may say that perhaps it didn't necessarily work, but is that because of the attempt or is that because it was cut short, that not enough was done, that it could have been more could have been done. Um, but significantly, the three amendments that we've talked about, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, um, they never come off the books. Their scope has changed over the years, um, but increasingly they are used 
more um, sort of in this continual battle for freedom and equality. Um, and most, most of these amendments, particularly the 14th, um, continue to be a factor in many Supreme Court cases uh, and civil suits going forward. So with that, I would like to sort of conclude our formal portion of the tour here. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd very much like to hear from you. Um, but I do want to thank you all so very much for joining me today. Um, we hope we're able to come visit the Constitution Center at some point soon. Um, and we do hope to hear from you. So we do have some questions appearing in the chat box now. Uh, and Jen, if you want to hop in at any point, but I'm going to go ahead and answer this first one here. Um, did Lincoln personally choose Johnson as vice president um, or did the party choose him? Uh, and that's a great question. Um, and it would have been, I believe, sort of a combination of both, but primarily the party. Uh, in many cases back then, it would not have been the individuals. Um, notably in the election of 1880, um, the winning ticket, James Garfield and Chester Arthur hadn't even met each other before they were elected as president and vice president. John, or Lincoln's first vice president was a man named Hannibal Hamlin from Maine. And it was seen that Hamlin was not able to deliver any tickets or any votes that Lincoln himself would not already win. Um, and looking at the legacy of Abraham Lincoln today, it's kind of impossible to think that he wouldn't have been reelected, but it didn't look that way in early 1864 as the year dragged into its fourth year. Um, before the momentum in that fall, um, it looked as though there might be, um, that Lincoln might lose. Um, so the picking of Andrew Johnson was seen as a way to sort of broaden the ticket's appeal. Um, and that would have been a decision that Lincoln may well have supported, um, but it would have been primarily done by the party. Well, thank you, Kevin, and lots of uh, compliments for you in the chat as well. So thank you for um, for leading us on this great tour. Um, as we, we put a lot of links in the chat as we were going along, um, so, we did say that if you enjoyed this tour, you can book a virtual tour of the Constitution Center, a private virtual tour. Um, those, uh, you know, the information about that is on our website. Um, so we can come into your school, to, uh, talk to your class, to your camp group, to a family reunion. Um, so go ahead and book a book a tour of either this exhibit or some of our other great exhibits at the Constitution Center. Um, there were also some great interactives um, that Kevin pointed out during the tour. Those are all available online as well. Um, so um, you can find those, particularly the drafting tables, that um, tool that lets you look at the, the creation and kind of the um, documents and primary sources that influence the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments are all on our um, interactive constitution on our website. On that site, you'll also find um, uh, tools for all different provisions of the constitution and all different constitutional topics. So make sure to explore that because it is a wealth of resources. Um, and um, as I mentioned at the top of the program, tomorrow we are celebrating Juneteenth. So there's also some great resources for uh, commemorating Juneteenth with us online. And as I mentioned, uh, free at the Constitution Center tomorrow, if you are in the area, uh, both the National Constitution Center and the African American Museum in Philadelphia are free. So if you are in Old City, Philadelphia, please come on down and visit us um, because we have lots of great programming um, and uh, wonderful exhibits for you to see. Great. So I'm seeing a few questions. And Jenna, please let me know how much time we have. There are um, one question here in the chat regarding the Dred Scott case uh, and the question of did Buchanan play any role in the Scott case? Uh, James Buchanan, of course, the president preceding Lincoln. Um, and he did, in fact. Um, there were several Supreme Court justices that we know there was correspondence that existed. Um, and Buchanan did indeed pressure the justices to rule on the decision and to perhaps take a more broader notion. And the um, decision was referenced in Buchanan's own inauguration, um, and he remarked in his inauguration that he would be happy to go along with the decision of the court, even though the decision would not be rendered for another, I think, two or three days. Um, so certainly Buchanan does attempt to influence the Scott decision, and that contributes to the legacy and the standing that he has among presidents today. Kevin, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and the uh, YouTube broadcast at this time, but we'll stick around if anybody has some other questions. So. Hey, great. Yeah.